for coming in. I really appreciate it. Okay. You got Thanks a busy, for having me. You got a busy week, and I know um, you've got kids and you got your work schedule. So yeah, really appreciate it. That's cool. <laughs> Last time you were here, you cracked out six loops. Yeah. You want to take us through that? What was your what was your previous record out here? Um, I hadn't done. I think I'd come out here three times previously and hit four. Right. So you, you've come to a few training runs, haven't you? Yep. Yep. How many events have you done? Dead Cow Gully events? Uh, two. I missed the first one because I was heavily pregnant. All right. <laughs> no excuses. <laughs> <laughs> right. So four was your previous record? Yep. And you cracked out six. Yeah. So um yeah that that's huge. So how do you um how did you prepare for that? How did you train for that? And um do you have any future goals? Um yeah, now I'd like to see how far I can go. Mm-hmm. Um it's hard at the moment because I do a lot of my training pushing a double pram and that's that's hard. Yeah. And heavy. Yeah. Um so that's sort of and it time limiting because the kids will only sit for mm-hmm. so long. I mean they're only 4 and 2, so you only get so much of an attention span. But um, Easter, I came out here and actually injured myself. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What what happened again? I slipped at the end of the first kilometre just yeah. on the road. I misplaced my foot and stood in some cow poo and slipped out. That's right. Because you were after a – I think we gave you like a snake bandage yeah. or something and you wrapped and it up. pulled myself out at four when it was really starting to hurt. So you, you that was that was in, at Easter, and then two months later you're back back at Dead Cow. Yeah. So you'd fully recovered from that injury. Yeah. Um, I stopped myself before I did a, um, any major damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To put training off. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, first question: um, Why do you why do you like coming out here, or not so much Dead Cow, but why do you like doing that sort of distance? Like, shouldn't you just be happy with your five k park run? What and like, I actually don't like the five k. Oh, you don't like it? No. Um, Why is that? Even when I started <coughs> running, I it wasn't until I started getting up towards the ten k mark that I actually really started to enjoy it. Mm. So I don't know. Um, for a long time, I was road running, and my favourite distance was just the half. Mm. So, right. and that's the first events I ever did were half marathons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, what, what do you? So how do you train? Because you're a police officer, yep. you're King Roy. You've got two young kids. Two. Yep. Yeah. You got a husband to look after as well. Yep. <laughs> how do you? Um, how do you fit it all in? Um, there's a lot of early mornings before work. So if I start work at six a.m., I'm often running by four a.m. Oh, really? Yeah, just locally, and that's how I either if he's been on a late shift, I'll get on the treadmill. I do have a treadmill mm. in our lounge room. Oh, gotcha. Um, or I'll be out the door and running around the streets at 4 a.m. with a headlamp. <laughs> really? Yeah. This is in Kingaroy? In Kingaroy. Yeah, wow. Wow. Um, so would most of your training be on the treadmill or actually on the road? Most of my training's with the double pram on the rail trail. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Is it a weird feeling if you're training with the pram? And if you enter an event without the pram, are you, have you got your hands up like this? Like I, I find on the treadmill I hold on. Yeah, especially yeah. with my right hand because that's the hand I mostly push it with. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, um, it, it is weird running without a pram mm-hmm. <laughs> on the odd occasion that I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was sort of thinking about you, Jenny, because I've only got some experience from you from, from Park Run. You've been out here a few times. Um, you are a small town's dream. So you've come here with your husband. You're both police officers in the community and you're raising a young family, this is just like, you know, it's tick, tick, tick. <laughs> you're, projecting the, you're protecting the community, you're contributing to the community, you're raising a family. So um, where, where, did you, where did you grow up and, and where did you come from before you, before you got here? I'm a Brisbane girl. Yep. I grew up in Brisbane. Um, yep. So most of my life there, but started school in Toowoomba. Dad got a transfer out there for a while. Yeah, right. So we lived there for a couple of years and then, yeah, I grew up in Brisbane. Is your dad a police officer? No, um, my dad's an environmental scientist. Oh, wow. So he worked for, at the time, the government running national parks or looking after national yeah. parks. Oh, cool. So you would you say you grew up in Brisbane or Toowoomba? I grew up in Brisbane. Yeah. We spent three years in Toowoomba. Oh, gotcha. And he transferred back. Yeah. Were you aware of this region? Like, had you driven through here on? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I knew where it was. We had been out here and one of the national parks dad covered was the Bunny Mountains. Mm -hmm. So we did spend a fair bit of time up there as well. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, in my early 20s, I nannied for two ecologists. Really? And we did a lot of travelling around Queensland. Country Queensland? Country Queensland. Yeah. So I've, I've done some, quite a bit of travelling through. So were, they, were these ecologists um, on the road all the time and were you tagging along to nanny? I, tagged, I was or? tagging along to look after Bub, but I also did a bit of work, field work with them because mm-hmm. um, they need, they always need a second person in the field. Um. I got into that through my dad. That's how I met them. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, we we just travelled pretty much for two and a half years. I was with them. We travelled. Jeez, on the road. Wow. Wow. That must have been an experience. So how far west did you go? Well, what was your furthest <laughs> kind of? Um, they mostly were doing gas pipeline work at the oh, time, okay. so the coal seam gas. So yeah. we spent a bit of time out in Injun and Roma. Yeah. A lot of time up in Billawilla. Gladstone, and then mm. um, following that line up over the Rolleston Range. Yeah, Billawill is a great town, isn't it's it? It's a beautiful I, town. I really like that place. Like I've, I've got a rental property up in Blackwater, and I often stop in yeah. in Billow. And yeah, you just get a feel for a town pretty quickly, and I yeah. think it's just a nice, just a nice town. I did love going there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now before we move on, let's bring up the most important point here. <laughs> Melissa Ballon. Oh, she's amazing. Trying to get her on the podcast. Yeah, she should come and chat. Now, I don't want I don't want you to like abuse your powers as a police officer. <laughs> I don't want you to use the taser. But <laughs> how can we get her on the podcast? Because she keeps turning me down. <sighs> like everyone thinks she's amazing. Like she she rocks up to masters, no training. She is amazing. At all, and she just pumps out twelve. Yeah. And and the Whit Sunday girls, like Liv Compton and um and Kirsty, Kirsty Ferguson, they're like, who is this? Yeah. And they, they think she's like, she's right up there. They can see something really special. She is amazing, Mel. Yeah, I know she's busy. I know she does big hours and um, there's a lot going on. But, yeah, I just sort of think that she, she would be a 24-hour plus <laughs> runner, don't you think? I, I do too. Yeah. So I don't um, think it would take much for her to get up there. Mm. For the listeners, uh, Melissa Ballon, she's a local runner uh, from Nanango and she just – she has done 100Ks. I think last year she did 15, yeah. 15 loops and then she um, had some interruptions with the training and then she pumped out 12 at the Masters. But the real thing is how do we get her on the podcast? Because, <laughs> you know, can you put some pressure on? I'll have a chat to her. <laughs> <laughs> Have a stern chat in your uniform, <laughs> in your uniform. So we had a, a police officer on beforehand, um, Jenny um, Cole. I think he was podcast number four. Cole actually, it was Sergeant Flaherty, actually um, signed off some of my stuff at the academy, oh, some wow. of my assessments. Did he train you? Um, he didn't train me. He signed off some of my assessments and I actually had a good chat to him out at the Masters. Oh, really? Yeah. Did he, did he recognise you? Or? Yeah. All oh, right, and I recognised him as well. So is he a bit of a big deal in the training academy? Like, is he is he right up there? He's one of the well, he was one of the sergeants when I was there, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, he is one who tra- who does train recruits. He wasn't on our intake, but he was definitely around the academy. Mm-hmm. So why did you get into the police force? Was it um, did you always have a burning desire to do it, or was it just something you fell into over time, or? I've always wanted to be in the police. I don't know why, mm. but going right back to what do you want to go when you grow up in preschool, there's pictures that mum still got of me having drawn myself in a police uniform back in the 90s. Really? Um, and when I left oh, yeah. school, I, I did go to uni uh, and you couldn't join straight out of school yeah. back, back when I finished school. So um, I did a lot and ended up at the academy. I had my 28th birthday at the academy. Oh, did you? Which was good because I had a lot of um, different experiences before I went, yeah, which right. I think helped. Right. What's, what's the training program like? Is it, um, is it fairly intense? It's – we do quite a few months at the academy, but it's overall – it was 18 months when I did it in total. Mm-hmm. You did the first six months at the academy and that's very heavy um, theory and legislation and your mm-hmm. basics of what you're going to be doing all the time. Mm-hmm. They also train you in how to drive the cars – um, and particularly with the lights and sirens. Yeah. 
um, and also um, how to use all of the equipment yeah. is some um, pretty heavy training. So are you um, are you living at the academy for those six months? I like- didn't. A lot of people did. Oh, so you've got the option of, of You do have the option, yeah. My uh, mum only lived 20 minutes from the academy, uh, okay. so I stayed with her. Yeah, yeah. So um, how many people get through the academy? Is it like, do some people get in there and think, oh, this isn't really for me? Like, I wonder what the, the dropout rate is. I don't know. We, I know we had one dropout after the first, um, first phase in our group and she just said it's not for me. Yeah. And they, they don't mind that because they don't go through all the training and then, mm-hmm. then lose you. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's getting heavier with the with the recruits now. I think, and it's just mm. I don't think it's what people think it's going to be. Yeah, sure. And, and what percentage would be females going through the training academy when you were there? <laughs> I went through the fifty fifty years, the early ones. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we were one of the early intakes of that. Yep. So we were fifty percent girls. Oh, cool. But it's it's not that anymore. Yeah. And do you have a? Do you have a, a bond with those people in the academy? Like, do you keep in touch with them? Some like, of them, yeah. Not all of them. Yeah, yeah. sure. Cool. Um, Rightio, so you go through the academy in 18 months and... Um, Six months at the academy and then you go to a training station. Oh, training 12 station. 12 months. Gotcha. And where was your training station? Ipswich. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right in the middle of Ipswich. <laughs> right. That's a good place to learn. <laughs> it was. It's a steep learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's the bit? I've asked this to Cole too. What's the big difference between the train, training to be a police officer and then like being on the ground and like this is it, like you're it and you're going, you're knocking on someone's door or you've, you've been called to a domestic or something like, is it just... Um, it's sort of funny. They give you scenarios at the academy, but they're all very almost sort of almost black and white. Mm. So they're not real complicated. And then you get out here and you realise... It's not like that at all. Mm. It's t- and you do spend a week in a station while you're at the academy, so you can put what you've learned into the back of a police car and follow them around and see, mm. um, see, see how to apply it or how they apply it. And that was good fun. I did that in Dolby because that's where mm. Jamie was stationed. Yeah. And then, yeah, you get out and you go, it's nothing like this at all. Yeah. And you learn on, on the ground. Dead Cow Gully coming at you for 2024, but we have a new race date. It's normally Easter Saturday, but for next year we are changing things up. The new date is May 4, same start time, 7 a.m., May 4. So the reason we're doing this is the weather will be slightly cooler, which means you can do more loops. Plus, I'm giving my parents a bit of a break. So um, they do a lot over that period, cleaning out toilets and all that type of thing. So they're going to take a bit of a holiday and uh, have some family time. So uh, the new date, May 4, and tickets will go on sale September 25 at 6 p.m. That's September 25 at 6 p.m. Thank you. See ya. So you'd have, you'd have to, I'd imagine, have to be nervous, pretty anxious in those first yeah. few weeks and months, surely you'd be like, because I guess you don't, when you wake up in the morning, you just don't know what's going to happen. No. And the, the, the station doesn't know what's going to happen. You get the call and then you're it. You're it. Um, so we were lucky. We had, we often had three or four cars on the road from our station, mm-hmm. which is the biggest one down in, in that region. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, my first day on the road, I think, because for the first eight, eight months, you'll sign up with a training officer and it can either be one person for the first eight weeks. It can either be one person for the full eight weeks or you do it with two. Mm. And I had two. So you spent the first four weeks with one officer mm-hmm. who trained you, took you, held your hand through everything. And then you spend another eight weeks with a second one who might do things slightly differently and you might learn something a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. But you'll go through another four weeks with him and then – you go and you got to do, I think it's 80% of your shifts with the training officer mm-hmm. throughout your first year. Mm-hmm. But my first day on the road, I think we were out station five minutes after our shift started, lights and sirens to a domestic. Oh, wow. Wow. And it didn't stop. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you again, if, if you can't talk about this, just, just let me know. Um, but if you arrive to a, a conflict situation like a domestic, what's, what's the number one thing? 
you have in mind? Is it just to try to calm the situation down? Is it just to try to lower the lower that level? It, like what's what's the what's the first thing you? you it you, depends on the situation. What's going on? Um, mm. And they're all completely. You can't look at one the same way. Even if you go to the same couple for the <clears> third <throat> time in a week, mm. you can't look at the situation the same as mm. as it was because everything is just sure. It, everything is just changing, and you don't know what set them off today. Sure. Um, and it also depends on um, are they armed? Is he? Yep. Is he hurting her, or are they just yelling at each other? Yeah. But yeah, you got to try and get in there and figure out what's what's going on quickly. And then calm them down and try and talk to them and find out what's going on and, mm-hmm. and see where we go from there, depending on whether they've got orders in place or there's no mm-hmm. orders in place or what the conditions are. Yeah, There's a million different things. And there's a million checks you're doing on the iPad on the way there if you know or don't know who you're going to. I mean, a lot of the locals here now, you know yeah. who you're going to um, before you get there. So you put their name in, in the in the we've database. We've got the in the database in the yeah. iPads. We've got, and then you can pull up whether there's an order between them or yeah. no orders or what the history is. Yeah, can you find out if that person is a registered firearm owner? That's on the database. You can yeah. you can see their criminal record. So then you can assess the threat level on the way out. Yeah, and then well, what- we've got everything's high risk or unknown risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you first arrive there. Is the is the is your first um, is your first thought um, how what's what's the risk like how do I protect myself so you're, you're looking for weapons right protect yourself and also protect um, the aggrieved so the yep. the person who does need your help or who's yeah. called you or whether so a lot of the times it's been neighbours who call yep call yep. us so what, once you've determined hey there is no weapons or um, you're not in any immediate danger do you just do you just try to? Is it? Is there, I'd imagine there's just a lot of talking. Is there a lot of talking back and we forth? We try to separate them and figure out what's going on, um, yeah. and get versions from all parties. Yeah. So the two involved, um, any witnesses, mm. neighbours, things mm-hmm. like that, just to try and figure out mm-hmm. what's going on. And half the time you're getting there and nobody will talk to you. Yep. So you don't know. Yeah. So. You'd, you'd hear two completely different sides of the story, right? So Sometimes, yeah. One person be saying this, another person saying that. Do you find the truth is somewhere in the middle? Yeah. We always <laughs> say there's three versions. There's this version, this one, and then this. Yeah. What's actually happened in the middle. Yeah. I, I suppose if you're, if you're highly emotional, can you really think straight? Like I often think um, your whole version of events can be, can be separated from reality. Because you're just highly emotive, you've got your adrenaline pumping, yep. you're having a huge fight. This could be a huge um, a boiling pot that's been going for 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden it explodes. It, it explodes. And then the, the, the version, um, it's amazing how you can have two completely different um, stories, yep. isn't it? But I guess, I guess your, the mind's a funny thing and your memory's a funny thing, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> People see things differently and especially if it's a heightened situation, you can get three different versions from three different witnesses who aren't involved as well mm. because they all hear things differently or they see things differently. So mm. you've got to figure out what's in what's going on in the middle. Yeah. And some days it's really hard. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And how do you um how do you then go home with your family, Jenny, and, and how do you kind of separate all that? That's I run. Day. You run. <laughs> I run. Right, so that's a big thing for mental health. That's that's a massive thing for my mental health, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's why you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's more of a benefit? Are, are you saying that a 5K run, you just don't get the same benefits um, as, a, as a half marathon? Well, some days I'll go home and if I haven't run, or even if I have run that day, I'll, I'll even do a mile hard on the treadmill and that'll mm. fix it before I go and pick the kids up from daycare and stuff yep. like that. Sometimes I'll we often walk to and from daycare, and you just got that. Even the walk, mm. it's about a mile, so walk down the hill to daycare, and it sort of settles, and then you go back into mm. crazy family life with toddlers. Mm-hmm. So, what's it like? Um, is it pretty rare to have um, Jamie's your husband um, to have a husband and wife no. team? Is that is it quite? Co- There's. There's three at my there's three at my station. At your station, so yep. this is quite a common thing. So you meet meet each other through through work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually didn't meet Jamie through work. I met him 
just after I applied to the academy. Oh, really? Yeah. He, so he's been in a lot longer than I have. Has he? He's top, He's clicked over his 10 years a couple of years ago now. He's approaching 15. Wow. And what have you done? Uh, I've been in – I walked out of the academy at the end of 2016. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sure. So I'm six, six and a half years. Mm. So I guess, I guess if your husband's a police officer and you come home from a stressful day and you're venting, um, it's good. Sh- surely he can relate. It's good because he understands. Yeah. He knows. And sometimes he'll have been at work too and he'll have heard the job on the radio or seen mm. it pop up on the screen because mm. we work in the same region. Yeah. So you know what jobs are going on. We work – um, South Burnett, so all the stations, we from Blackbutt all the way up to Sherberg, out to Proston, mm. we're all on the same channel, we're all on the same screen, so yeah. we see all their jobs pop up. <coughs> um, so sometimes you'll just know that the other one's had a really stressful or mm. bad job. Is it all consuming though? Like if you're venting to Jamie and Jamie's <laughs> venting for you, it's just 100% um, yep. your work. We I do try to keep that away from home too. Yeah. Um, especially in front of the boys and not talk about too much mm. um, work stuff and what's going on because we don't want to expose them to that. No. Not at their age. No, no. And and I've mentioned this to Cole. How do you still stay positive? Because you strike me as <laughs> – I don't know what you like at work, <laughs> but at Parkrun you seem to be very upbeat and positive and smiling and um, – you're dealing with stuff which which I don't see. You kind of know that it exists. It's out there. You deal with it on the front line. How do you still – how are you positive about the community you live in and not get all negative and um, jaded? Um, again, I run a lot. Yeah. How um, I swim in the summer too. Yeah. But um, I still have a lot of friends out of the police world, so you still mm-hmm. – um, can leave that on your days off. And I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, mm. so I get down quite often into their world yep. and just play with them. And so, they have a very positive outlook. So great. I try to do it for them as well and just keep everything happy and trucking along. Right, so you've got a major distraction there, which is your kids. Yep. Yeah. So if you're a single police officer and you go home to an empty apartment, yep. you could just – Think about things. Yeah, and I did that a lot, um, in, especially in my training year. I was in Ipswich and Jamie was in Dalby, mm-hmm. so we didn't live together. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're trying to chat to each other on the phone, but it's hard because you can't go home and talk to him. I was living with um, another police officer for a while, so that was good. She was a um, detective down there. so mm-hmm. And you just talk to each other as well. Yeah. We've got a good group. Um, South Burnett in general is a great group of people, but um, especially at Kingaroy. We've got a great, great group of people. Mm. Everyone just looks after each other as well. How many, how many officers at um, King of Roy? Uh, at the moment, 16, but we're waiting to fill two positions. Yeah. And do, the, do all the South Burnett stations uh, interact with each other because there'd be a crossover in jobs maybe or yep. um, is it quite common? So you, you, would know, you would know all the other – or most of the other officers at, let's say, Merg and um, Nanango? You get to know everyone. Um, you do. You will go, especially when I – because I originally transferred out to Nanango. Mm. Um, and then after I came back part-time, after we had Henry, they transferred me to Kingaroy, bigger station. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not – especially for Nanango, uncommon to go to Blackbutt quite frequently to back up the officers down there um, mm. or Yarraman or Kuya or even come up and help us at Kingaroy. Mm. Because they wouldn't have much staff out that way. No. Um, so King and Morgan are your 24-hour stations. Yeah. And everyone else is on call mm-hmm. after hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well. Um, right. So um, how often do you guys all get together and, and socialise? Is that important? Like do you have a barbecue or do you, do you go to the pub and just let off some steam? Like what? Um, uh, they do run events. We do have a social club and they do run events. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just depends on who's working and who's not and other family commitments. It, pretty much everyone at my station has kids mm. um, at different stages in growing up. So it mm. depends around that. But you also socialise with um, different families as well yep. outside of work and all the kids play together and things like that. Mm. Mm. Do you ever get anyone come up to you in the community like, and say, look, thanks for your service. Thanks so much. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um 
Is that quite rare or does it take a... It is, um, but you do get people do it and I find it, especially the older generation, are very quick to come up and mm. say thank you. Mm. Um, but in December, after the incident happened out in Tara, mm. we had a lot of it. We had food coming through the stations sure. for days and that's when you see a lot of the good community support is when real bad things happen to us. Mm. I can only imagine what it feels like when that incident happened at Tara. Like, um, I mean, I think it affected everyone in a certain way, but actually being a police officer, since you've got that close-knit group and it's one of your own, it's, I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's like a family, isn't it? It must just be... It must have just been a horrible day going to the station, right? For, for, for probably a few days. Um, they're actually friends with friends of ours as well. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, so we, we spent a lot of time talking to friends after that as well. Oh. Um, who were Because Jamie was over in Dolby and both of them had trained there. Oh. Um, long after he left, but yeah. Mm. yeah sorry, Jenny. <laughs> no. That's yeah, that's shocking. It was. Um, okay, so you have some people um, say thanks for your service. Do you also have people who you've helped them out in a certain way and they're like, God, I'm so glad you turned up. You've, you've just <laughs> yeah, you've again, saved my life. Thank you so much. It's usually, um, again, with the good people who we don't have much contact with. If, when people get broken into or something's mm. happened or they witness something or car accidents, yeah, you do hear from um, those people a lot. And they are thankful that we do turn up when they need us. Mm. And then you've got the other side of it, which is the people we see all the time who mm. don't like us at all. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, right. So, look, if you weren't a police officer, did you ever think about what else you might be? Or do you think it's always been this? Did you ever think, well, um, I guess you're saying from, from, from a child you were drawing – pictures of yourself and as a police officer. But did you ever have a think about an alternative? Uh, I have most of an education degree for primary education. All right. Yeah. So, so you could be a teacher. I did go to uni. I didn't finish it. Right. Um, I was working at the Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron at the time and I've been there since I was 14 as a sailing instructor. Oh, really? Yeah. Gee whiz. And um, I was at uni but a position came up there full time and I left uni to work at the Yacht Club. Oh, wow. Yeah. What, what yacht club's that? Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron at Manly. At Manly? Yeah. Oh, cool. So I, I don't know much about that area. What's um, So w what were you doing there? What was your job? Um, I worked in the sailing department and we ran the sailing school. So taught a lot of people to sail, a lot of kids, ran a lot of coaching programs mm. and also ran all of the yacht racing, dinghy racing. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, so you're getting paid. You're getting paid for yep. that position. So you can you can sail a yacht. Yeah, I've been sailing my whole life. Really? Yeah. Did you did you um did you grow up near the water? Yeah, my parents are sailors, so I God, I could sail a boat on my own when I from a young age. Gee whiz! Have you ever thought about doing a like a big trip? Have you been on a big trip yourself? Like I'm talking like, have you been out to? Not really. I sailed smaller boats, so off the beach. Yeah. Um, so the dinghies. How would you like to do a trip out to the Pacific or like a, a, a massive? It'd be amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you'd be so you've got you've got your license. Do you, you got? Do you need a license? To Not for a private one, no. You don't. No. Okay. Oh, you need a boat license, mm. just a your normal tinny one that gives you the rights to drive a tinny. That's mm. it. Mm. Unless you're doing it commercially, that's when your yeah. licenses come in. Have you ever thought about that, going on a, a bit of a sailing trip? Like could bring the kids along, you could sail all the way up to We did North one at Queensland. the end of last year. We were lucky enough that one of my friends from work, <coughs> they did it for their 10th wedding anniversary. Um, so we sailed off the coast of Harvey Bay for four days with them. They did a really? week and we did four days with them. Yeah, wow. Have you ever been caught in some wild weather? Yeah, we um, through school. I sailed through school as well. Because there's the high school I went to had a sailing team, and we went up. They had a, the state titles at Easter every year, and as the start gun went, a storm blew through, and we the boat capsized, and we couldn't get the, the mainsail down, 
um, under the water. The hall- we didn't realise at the time the halyard was broken. Um, so we floated for about four hours and I, on the upturned boat, my friend and I. What? <laughs> until my... Where, where uh, was this? Harvey Bay. How, how far from the shore were you? Uh, we are about a... Cl- uh, Dad says we are about a kilometre out past Point Vernon. God. <laughs> so you were, you were floating on... On the boat, yeah. Your feet, so it, your feet were dangling in the water. In the water. Jeez. So the boat's on its side, the sail's in the water. Dad and uh, um, one of his other skiffy mates ended up sailing it back because we couldn't get the sail down. Stuff. that. When was this? Uh, I was 14, I think. So, Kate, okay, <laughs> just go back a bit. How did, how did, you, how did you capsize again? The, a st- um, well, a windstorm blew up just as the start gun went for the race that day. So and there's, there's plenty of help around. Yeah. So they knew what – but you were still in the – But there wa- were so many people in trouble. And gotcha. there's only a certain number of rescue boats and there were so many people ah. needing help that – So you got your life jacket on. Yep. Yeah. But your feet are still dangling in the water. Any, your whole body's in the water. Did any thoughts cross your mind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my, she's one of my best friends, the girl I was sailing with. Yeah, she kept thinking about sharks. <laughs> Please, 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 please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are up over 600 subscribers now and we are edging towards that magic 1,000 subscribers. Now, what that means for us is if we get 1,000, we can actually get paid for YouTube advertisements. So this extra money that comes in from YouTube advertisements will help us pay for the content we put out. So these documentaries we put on, they cost money. Podcasts we do, it costs money. So um, we think this is really good content. So all you have to do is hit subscribe and that would help us reach that magic 1000 number. Thank you so much. Back to the podcast. I went on a, I went on a fishing charter um, uh, not last, yeah, last weekend. Last weekend, um, what's Monday today? Yeah, so last weekend, it was my first fishing charter yeah. at um, at Harvey Bay. I took some of my clients out. And um, I'm not really from a fishing family. Dad never fished. I don't know much about it. I've never <laughs> been out like deep sea. Yeah. Um, but I tell you what, it was, it was an older boat and um, – and the guy was going through the this this old skipper was going through the safety yeah. stuff and like I was expecting maybe like a big blow up boat if we had an emergency like a big blow up dinghy, but nah, it was just um, just these flotation devices <laughs> where you hang on to, and your yep. your, bo- your body's in the water. I'm thinking, God, I'm not sure if I like this, <laughs> and I just sort of it just sort of played in my mind. Oh God, okay, and then we started going out. And I felt like a little bit anxious, a little bit worried because you go further and further out and you're just sort of seeing Harvey Bay in the distance. In the end, it was pretty good. We went out to Platypus Bay and we started fishing. And when, when the boat was kind of stationary and you could see Fraser, I felt okay. But just initially I was like, oh, <laughs> you feel pretty vulnerable, don't you? Yeah. And you, you just you can't see the bottom and it's just, yeah. So that was, fun, that, that was a bit of a... Uh, that's obviously a memory you won't forget when you when you capsized. I actually don't remember a lot of it. Um, mm. I don't know why. Mm. We still had fun. <laughs> yeah, I was with one of my best friends. So yeah. So you don't have a bucket list trip you're thinking about? Like, what if you sailed from here to Fiji? Or? That costs a lot of money, and I'd need a boat. <laughs> yeah, and one that would be set up to do that. Yeah, that's expensive. Yeah. Would the uh, would the Queensland Police have a sailboat? No. no. <laughs> they have big boats, but none of them have sails. You could raise money for charity or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, so what else can you tell us, Jenny? I I honestly, I don't know a whole lot about you. I know you're a police <laughs> officer and you like to run. Yeah. Do you have anything else? Um, I only picked up running about nine and a half years ago. Okay. I wasn't a runner before that. I grew up swimming and sailing and if it wasn't mm. on the water, I wasn't real interested. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was actually living, I was nannying for police in Tara. Oh, wow. And I was heavily overweight. Really? Yep. And I lost weight um, swimming because I have a 50 meter pool out there. Mm. And I grew up swimming, so I, 
I knew I could get back in the water and swim. So I'd mm. swim before I picked the kids up from school because it was on that, not the tower is a huge down, it's tiny, but um, the pool was on that side of school. So I'd go to the pool and then pick the kids up from school and then we'd walk home. And I lost a lot of weight doing that. When, when you say you're overweight, what are we talking? Like, are you? I lost, I think, the total now would be nearly 40 kilos. You're kidding. No. You're kidding. No. So is this after your pregnancy? No, before. Bef- long before. Oh, before kids? Yep. Ah. So right. we're talking 10, 10 and a half years ago. Yeah, wow. 40 kg? Yeah. I can't picture that. <laughs> I can show you photos. Yeah, show me later on. Um. Oh, God. Just one second, yeah. folks. I got my phone. I. I was with Cole and um, <laughs> I had everything set up. And um, during the podcast, the phone just kept going oh. off. <laughs> and I was just like, damn it. And, and Marie was in the next room, his, his wife, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> shut that thing up. Right, so um, h- how did you put on the weight? Was it just gradually over I time? gradually after school. Yep. I was pretty active and then – because um, we used to have to walk nearly a kilometre uphill from the train station to the school every day. Yeah. It's on top of the hill and the train's at the bottom of it. Um, after school, I went to uni and you just sort of lose track of... That's know, a common thing, right? Because you yeah. see people when they leave school and you look at them a year later when they've been living on their own or mm. in college. So it's a combination of like drinking and just eating just... Not great food. Not great food. Because like, you can buy your own yeah. And there's no one there to suggest maybe you shouldn't eat that for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yeah. So I think it was gradual over mm. a number of years. And mm. then after I left, um, start working at sailing, it there was more, I think, because I wasn't active at all then. Mm. Mm. So was there a point um, in Tara where you said... Um, enough's enough. You just lo- you looked in the mirror and you thought, well, this can only go one way. Well, I knew to get into the police and I took the, I was interested in the job initially. So I was like, if I go there and, and like it and, and see it, then I'll probably go from there to the academy. And I knew there was a lot of fitness standards to get into the academy that you've got to meet um, to leave, to graduate. Mm. Um, and I was like, well, it's, it's now or never. And I had time. I was nannying, but the kids were at school. Mm-hmm. They were young, but they were... I was school age or kindy and then school aged mm. when I was out with them. Um, so I decided I was just gonna gonna do it. And my boss at the time, she was um, starting to go on a health kick as well and starting to get back into running. Mm. Um, and I thought oh, I don't want to run, so I'll swim because you fall back. Mm. I think to what you know. Mm. And then picked up a strength training program. Then we got to the end of summer and the pool closes. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? Because I'd been in the pool multiple, three or four times a week at least. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, there was no gym. The closest gym was in Dolby. Did you start to lose weight when you um, – I lost it all swimming. You lost it all swimming? Pretty much oh, about 33 kilos of it swimming. Wow. And then the rest has come off slowly. Wow. So how 